Good morning, everyone. Let's open with a word of prayer. Father, we thank you that we can be here in attendance. Thank you for just, uh, just allowing us to do so. And we just pray you just help us to uh, quiet our hearts and uh, be able to worship you today, listen to the message, and keep our, our spiritual ears open as we do so. Uh, just help us to just rely on you even more and more with the craziness of our country and the world. And just, uh, just help us to just uh, lean on you for everything. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Would you please stand as we sing hymn 219, Surely the presence of the Lord is in this place. Town Chapel here this morning. As I say each week, we pray that it's a blessing for you to be here. It's great to have you join us here this morning. And those that are joining us online, great to have you with us here today also. You can follow along in your bulletin for the things that are coming up. And uh, no evening service tonight as well, uh, our luncheon today. And we'd love to have you stay for lunch, even if you didn't bring any food. I know we uh, will have never ran out of food here at Wagontown Chapel. So if you're visiting with us here, we'd love to have you join us for, for lunch right afterwards. And if you just are thinking, I forgot today's lunch, and even though I heard about that last month or so, that's okay, you can stay for lunch too, okay? We'll just have you go last in line, so that's all. But, <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. But uh, join us for lunch, no evening service tonight, but, um, uh, make sure you make note of those things as well. In fact, as I said last week, no evening service for, for the summertime because we're, it's just so busy every single Sunday. Luncheons, holidays, Old Mill. Um, Old Mill will be the, third, uh, the fourth Sunday of this month, the last Sunday of the month here. That's at Old Mill at 6 o'clock. That is rain or shine. So make sure you make note of that. So uh, evening service that night out at the camp at the Old Mill. Uh, Sue Kranz's Bible study is this Tuesday, so those that are involved in that, uh, make sure you make note of that too. Tuesday night at 6 o'clock here in the Fellowship Hall as well. You do have sharing and caring coming up on the 21st, which is next Tuesday, if I'm not mistaken on that. Not, not this coming, the following. Not this coming, but the following. The following Tuesday. So, so two Tuesdays away. You are to bring a dessert if you are able. 11 o'clock, if it's a nice, beautiful day, you'll be out in the church pavilion out there for a picnic as well. They are also collecting Child Evangelism Fellowship uh, is collecting toys. So they're asking if you would like to. Um, uh, there's a list of items on this bulletin board, right out this one, not the one out there, but the one out there. There's a list of items that they give you that you can buy if you like um, or to go buy and then collect and then you are to bring them to Tuesdays to uh, sharing and caring if you choose to to participate in that as well. Um, next Saturday, next Saturday, we are painting the Fellowship Hall. So those that don't mind painting, uh, we're going to be painting the Fellowship Hall walls and things in there. That's the 18th on the next Saturday. Uh, I think at 9 a.m. they're going to begin. So I think they'll just provide all the, all the brushes and things like that. All you have to do is provide the hands of work. So if we get enough people in there, it'll go real quick. So... Uh, we're planning to update the Fellowship Hall very, very nicely in the future with painting. And then we're also going to be, Lord willing, redoing the floors in there, which you will know about once we're ready to get to that point as well, too. So, um, but that's next Saturday, June 18th, for that if you want to help out with those things also. And then we have archery camp, uh, not this week, but the following week, Tuesday, Thursday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, 21, 22, 23rd of June 
Uh, we do have a sign up out on that bulletin board as you leave. We're looking for brownies. We're looking for brownies. We don't need them right now. We, we, need, them the, uh, we need them the last night. The last night to so June 23rd is when we need them. So don't make them now or they'll be hard as a rock by then. Okay, so, uh, but if you could help us out in that, June 23rd is our closing. And uh, so if you could help out with brownies, that way we can help give those to the kids and the families that are there. And as we share the gospel with them on the 23rd of that camp week as well too so uh, make note of those things and then we're going to ask you for brownies very next monday so if you sign up for brownies this time and you don't want to sign up the next time that's fine but the 27th we'll need brownies for that's for the camp at the old mill we are doing dinner for for their camp that night and so we're doing brownies for dessert so if you want to help out with that so we're going to be asking you within four days to make some a lot of brownies okay so but if you can help out with those things those brownies you can bring the following Sunday, so that would be whatever that, the 26th, I think. June 26th will be the brownies due for that one. Um, or the 27th, early in the morning, or you know, sometime during the day, you can bring them too. But we will need them the 27th and the 23rd. Okay, so make sure you make note of those things. I believe that's all the announcements that we have for this morning. We do welcome you to Wagontown Chapel here, and it's a, we pray it's a blessing, again, as we say each and every day, for you to be here. And uh, so glad to have you here today. We're going to have you turn in your hymn books once again to page 571, 571, Trust and Obey. And we'll sing the first and the last verse. When we walk with the Lord in the light of his word, what a glory he sheds on. we do his good will he abides with us still and with all who will trust and obey trust and obey for there's no follow along in your care and prayer in the bulletin there just give you just a few updates and one new new one she's already on but there's an update on her nancy bernard nancy bernard fainted yesterday um they don't know why so she's in paoli hospital and uh she uh didn't come to for a little bit and so I, I texted her this morning and talked with her through text, and she feels fine today, but they're running tests to figure out what's going on and what caused that as well, too. And uh, so keep, keep Nancy Bernard in your prayers. Uh, she's at Paoli Hospital. And uh, Bill Pratt came home Thursday from University of Penn. Uh, he's doing okay. Uh, he was sick only one day, I think, from the pills so far. Um, but uh, he's been just real tired, so it's been making him real tired. So he, chill, he still tries to get up, walk around a lot, and do things. He was outside the other day just kind of making sure he's keeping mobile. But um, he's still very tired. And so continue to be praying for, for, for Bill and Judy as they continue to go through this. And they're going to go continue to go through it. He has to, this week is a busy, he, he's had off. This weekend, just from everything else except for the cancer pill, he'll be, he takes that 21 days straight. So he's already, I don't know, 10 days in, something like that. 
So um, he still has 11, 11 more days of that. And then he, he'll continue with that through the rest of his life, but he does have breaks. It will stop for maybe a week, depending on where his blood work comes out. It might go for two weeks before they start the chemo pill. It all depends on where his blood work is at that time. But uh, either way, it'll be one or two weeks or somewhere in there, and then I'll be back on the pill again for another 21 days and so on. So that's how it works. And so just pray for him. He's just, again, just been really tired. They've, they've gone through a lot. Uh, this week, we'll jump right back into a lot of things. He, um, I think every, every other day, I think, or at least two, two times this week, he has to get transfusions done. Um, and that's just to help him get a little bit more strength. So I think he needs to have that, like, Every week, he needs at least to have it twice a week, if not every other day during the week for transfusions, just to keep his uh, blood levels where they need to be and all that kind of thing. So he's going to be traveling a lot each week with that, with all that too. So the only nice thing is, if there is anything nice about it, is that they do have a pick line in, so they everything's set up. They don't have to poke and prod or anything like that each time. So he'll be having that pick line for for uh, for permanently. For, as well too so they might change it in time just to redress it and redo it eventually but so continue to be praying for them so those are the updates on on those two as well um all the other ones that we continue to have i i did see zoltan last week we had communion with him and he's you know kind of the same but he's doing fairly well he's able to you know they get him up and walk with them um each day and are working to strengthen that it's just that it, uh, he still has, again, still a lot of tightness. I feel like he just has a long way to go, you know, physically with the, with the stroke and the, result, and the effects of that. So continue to be praying for, for he and Tracy, his wife, as they continue to uh, go through this together as well, too. And again, not to take away from anybody else, but we have all the other ones that we have on our list as well. Continue to be praying for each of them. Let's pause and let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we ask that you would work in our lives today. Father, we're thankful that you care for us. And God, we know and, we, and sometimes we expect for you to care for us because you're God and you ought to love and care for everyone. But Lord, the amazing thing isn't that you care for us. The amazing thing is, is that even while we were yet sinners, you died for us. And that even in our sin that we still yet struggle with, even as believers... You still care for us. And God, that's the amazing thing. It's easy to care for somebody that is loving and kind and good. But Lord, it's a totally different thing to care for somebody who is, is, uh, is a sinner just saved by grace. And uh, we thank you for, for meeting us where we're at, loving us, and continuing to work in us to not keep us where we're at, but to mature us to a greater relationship with you. I pray for each of us here today, those that are in the pews and those that are listening online, watching online, we pray that you would be with each one and their families to which they represent. Lord, you know every up and down, you know every struggle, you know every circumstance that each family is, that is represented is going through and dealing with. You know what's lying on their schedules for the coming week, the things that they don't look forward to, the things that they're still wondering what the results may be, and on we pray thankful that you're not only a God that cares, but a God that knows all things. And so you know what this week holds for us. And we ask that you would help us to trust you with it. Help us to rely and rest on you for you alone know what comes ahead. We pray today for uh, each one in hospitals today, nursing homes. We ask that you would meet the needs of each one. And we pray for their struggles, their ups and downs, their battles as well we pray for the unspoken prayer request this morning those that to which you know only and, and somebody else in this room and uh, we pray that you would work in those particular prayer requests the situations and the people that are involved in them and uh, we thank you for knowing again all those things as well we do ask that you be with our country today god we know that uh, there's never a time that we should ever stop praying for our country uh, prayer is so much needed in this country. We ask that you would be with all uh, aspects of where our nation is right now, where you have already known it to be. You already know where it will continue to go. We do ask, Father, that in the midst of all of these things, that you would um, bring revival 
Father, we pray for revival within, within our nation. We understand that it must begin within our own individual lives, not pointing of fingers other places. But help us to see our own sin for what it is. And Lord, uh, seek your forgiveness and your uh, provision in our life. We pray for our president, vice president, all of those in authority. We ask that you would meet the very needs of their lives. We pray for that they may come to the saving knowledge of you. Lord, we pray that you would give wisdom, that they would accept your wisdom, that it is, which is from above. And we pray that you would work within uh, the authority uh, in our nation from the top to the bottom, to our local law enforcement and, and uh, those in authority here as well. We turn all of these things over to you, asking for your, your help, asking for understanding, and asking for uh, help you to help us to be obedient to follow after you today. We think of our missionaries. We ask that you would be with each one, encourage them, strengthen them, be with those now that are home on furlough. We pray that you would bless them and those that we have coming here, even one coming this, week, uh, this month. Yet, Lord, we pray for each one that is home and those that are still out throughout the world. We pray that you would minister to their, to their lives, help them in their ministries, marriages, and support. We ask all of these things and much more. In the precious name of Jesus, we ask it. Amen. Those going to junior church can, can meet me down front or there's not a whole lot in here to go down. You come in or no? No. All right. Yes, sir. I guess I'll talk to all of you. I wanted to ask. Well, I'm going to talk to Blaine anyway because he's the one that's going to be able to answer me. Blaine, have you ever had anybody stick up for you? Yeah. yeah. How does that? How, how's that feel when somebody sticks up for you? Good. It does. We as adults too have hopefully have had somebody in our life over the years. That would, that would stand in the gap for you. That would, that would stand up for you. That would uh, plead your cause to somebody else. And maybe it was something small. Maybe it was that recess or whatever it was. And, and, and uh, you weren't going to be picked right away. And one of your friends stood in and said, I, I'm picking this person here. And they, and they took, took you on their team. There's different ways to which people have stood up for us in our lives and hopefully as adults we still have people that were willing to do that as well but today we're going to look in our study in first john that there is no greater person who has uh, stood up in your place and my place than that of jesus christ and the bible talks about the word we're going to look at today is that he is our advocate our advocate and he is the one to whom is our defender. He's the, he's the pleader of our cause. And he has already paid it all. And that's an awesome thing to know a Savior who will take our place, one to whom steps in and stands on our behalf and pleads our, our cause, our case before the Father and uh, and always wins. He's undefeated once and for all. And so I encourage each of the kids to understand, you know, it's good that when somebody stands in, in your stead and somebody is willing to stand up for you. And there's no greater one I want each of the kids and the adults to understand today than that of Jesus Christ. And the question is, is he your advocate? Is he your advocate? And that comes by a uh, relationship with Jesus Christ. If you are ready to go, the children can go down to Junior Church and uh, go from there as well. We're going to have you stand uh, one time before the message here, page 605, 605, Living for Jesus. First, first and last. And second. First and second, I'm sorry. First and second verses, okay?
pray. Heavenly Father, we pray as we get into just two verses here this morning that you would work in our hearts and our minds, that we would grasp it and understand it. Even those, uh, for many of us, it's, it's reminder for us today. But for some here today, it might be the first time in hearing this, Lord, or their hearts are at a place now that they may accept it, receive it, take it. And we pray today, Lord, for your name to be glorified and praised and honored. I ask it in the precious name of Jesus. Amen. First John, we're looking at First John chapter 2 here this morning. First John chapter 2. And as you're turning there, in our study so far, we have recently looked at what John writes to born-again believers, those that know Christ by faith alone. Both of what a genuine believer should be doing and desiring not to do. And so what do we desire to do? John's talked about and challenged you and I and other believers that we ought to be walking in the light, spending time in the presence of God in his word, that we ought to be daily doing that. We're going to look at that a little bit deeper here today, but John telling us in verses 5 and down in this first chapter but also telling us what we ought not to be desiring to do, which is sin. And when we sin, because it's not if we sin, it's when we sin, because even as believers, we, are, we still struggle in the flesh. But when we sin, that we ought to desire forgiveness. We ought to desire to confess it before the holy and righteous God, who in that confession will forgive us of our sins. And so desiring to walk in his light and desiring not to sin as best as we can. And that's kind of what we looked at the last week or two as well. Today we're going to look at, as I already talked about just briefly in the children's sermon, is that Christ is our advocate and what that means. And so really what we find here just in the first two verses of 1 John chapter 2, John is kind of reemphasizing and going over kind of what he just went over in verses 5 down to verse 10 in uh, chapter 1 in the same kind of um, thing that he's reminding us of as well. We looked at 1 John 1, 9 last week. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So John continues these same thoughts, but with a little bit more detail in our study today of these two verses. In particular, in verse 9, when he's talking about that Christ is just and faithful to forgive us our sins. Well, he's going to explain to us in this chapter, especially in this first verse and second verse, of how he is able or how he has been able to do that. How he's able to forgive. What has he done? And we're going to look in greater detail of that here today. Let's just look at two verses. That's all we're going to cover here today. Chapter 2 of 1 John. John writes, My little children, these things write I unto you, that you sin not. And if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. And he is the propitiation 
for our sins. And not only for ours, but also for the sins of the whole world. Great, great thoughts here to which John writes to again writing to Christians here. He calls them my little children, my little children. Now, we don't know exactly why he's writing this way. Obviously, little children would be children of God. My little children, maybe that these ones have come to the saving of knowledge through John's preaching. But little children being those to whom are believers in Christ. Because as we well know that when one comes to the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ, that when we are born again, we are adopted into the family of God. And therefore, we are children of God. No longer children of disobedience. No longer children of wrath. Also insinuating that he calls them his little children because John loves them. John loves them. So John's telling them of why he's writing. So he says this in the very first verse to which we read. This is why I'm writing you. And the first thing he says is, I want you to understand that you ought not to sin. Because we talked about last week, if we remember, that even as believers, there is still the flesh that we deal with. And so you and I will sin on a daily basis. But the desire to sin, as we're going to look at in deeper form, Romans really covers that. And we're going to look at a few verses there. But that once we are saved, once Christ has saved us by what he has done fully on the cross, we have done nothing to deserve it or earn it. But once he has saved us, that you and I are now born again, children of God, yet we still struggle with the flesh. And as we look at in Romans here in a few minutes, that it is that sin no longer has full power over you and I as believers because of Christ working in our life or the Holy Spirit indwelling in our life. And so therefore helping us to not sin as much as we may have done before salvation. So Christianity or salvation or being born again does not make you sinless, but it ought to make you sinless. There's no perfection here. There's still the struggle of sin in the life of the believer. And this is why John wrote 1 John 1, 9. If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just. But this is what John's saying. He's saying, but it's also not a license to sin. That even though Christ died for sin, that doesn't mean you and I can just go and sin freely and just say, well, I'll just ask God to take away my sin. And then go back to that sin with no desire to walk away from it. You might go back to the same sin from time to time. But there still ought to be something in us that desiring not to go back to that. But sometimes temptation is stronger than where our faith may be at the moment and we fall into it once again. So we're not telling us not to sin anymore. It's the same thing to which Jesus would say. In many occasions when he would heal somebody. Remember the woman who had um, many husbands. And so then he forgave her, but what did he tell her? Go and sin no more. He healed other people and say, go and sin no more. Now, he wasn't saying, go and I know you're never going to sin again. But he was telling them, desire not to. Don't follow after that. So as believers, there ought not to be a strong desire for sin. It no longer has power in that way because of the work of the Holy Spirit, not because of anything you and I do. But... Temptation is real, and many times temptation is strong, and therefore uh, each day we, we fall into things. But this is great to know that even when we do fall into things, that Christ is there to forgive you and I. So this is why John writes. 
I'm writing to you these things that you sin not, that you desire not to sin. He's continuing what he's been saying here in verses 5 to 9 that we just looked at last week. And as we have um, a need not to strive to sin as much as possible, but a desire for you and I as believers to be in the light. Now, it's hard. It is hard. See, when, when Christ has saved us, there is that desire for the Spirit as well, only because the Holy Spirit indwells you and I. And so it's the Spirit working in our life that, that draws for you and I to obey Christ, to be obedient to the Word. And we read a lot of verses through the Scripture, and Paul writes, and this is a very familiar verse to many people in 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 17. Look what Paul writes. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. And so at the point of salvation, there is this transforming that God takes a stone heart and gives you and I a heart of flesh. And there is this transformation that happens. Similar to that which, in fact, the word is used the same in our English word. Now, I forget the word off the top of my head. But when a caterpillar transforms into a butterfly, metamorphosis, got it. That's what it's talking about here. There's a metamorphosis happening. There ought to be such a, such a, a changing as you see differently from a caterpillar becoming a beautiful butterfly. There is that metamorphosis. And so as believers, there ought to be a metamorphosis happening only by the working of Christ, the working of the Holy Spirit in our life that brings that metamorphosis out that there ought to be seen those that desire to follow after Christ. And this is what he's been talking about through this study so far. This is why he says that if you walk in the light, as he is in the light, that you will declare unto you that God is light and in him is no darkness. And then that's why John says, but if you say you don't have fellowship or you have fellowship, but you're not walking in the light, but you're walking in darkness, then you're lying and not doing the truth. That doesn't mean that we don't, again, sin. There are times where we Fall into darkness, but walking is a consistent sea. That I'm going to continue to sin and have no desire for obedience. Then you'd have to really see where your salvation is at. But Paul writing here of this metamorphosis happening. Then Paul writes this in Galatians 2.20, another familiar verse. I have been crucified with Christ... It is no longer I who lives, but Christ lives in me. In the life which I now live, in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. So Paul here also emphasizing that when a believer is saved, or you are saved as a believer, when you are born again, that Christ lives in you. But he still mentions there, now it's not I that live, but the flesh I live by faith in the Son of God. So you still have that battle of the flesh. But, Christ, but Paul emphasizing that it's not me that's really living. I'm not do the, doing the obedience. It's Christ working in me. Christ living in me. Desiring to please God. But Paul says, I, st I live in the flesh, which is that struggle with sin as well. So John's encouraging also what Paul has also written about too. We know, you know, like, but, but how, do we, how do we not fall into sin? How do we as believers continue to show forth that we are being obedient to God? Well, we can't do it alone. Coming to church one Sunday for the week isn't going to get you through. If that's the truth, I want you to eat lunch today and then don't eat until next Sunday. Tell me how you do. When it comes to spiritual growth, spiritual food of the word of God, it has to be daily intake, just like physical food. 
And if there's not daily intake of the word of God, there will be daily intake of other things, which will most likely not be of the word of God, which will find us falling into sin more often than we would if we were spending time in the word. We read verses such as Psalms 119 verse 11. Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. Knowing the word of God, memorizing scripture. So that when things do come to mind, that something else comes to mind as scripture. Which kind of reminds you to say, I shouldn't be doing this or I shouldn't go any further with this. I shouldn't, right now I'm just being tempted. I haven't given in to that temptation. But if I do, it's going to become sin. Temptation's not sin. But, but giving in to the temptation does become sin. We read, we read verses such as John 15, those, those, those powerful passages of Scripture to where Jesus is speaking. And there in John, where most of the next couple of chapters, if you have a red-letter Bible, are written in red because it's mostly Jesus talking there. But Jesus speaking in John 15, almost the entirety of this chapter is all Jesus. It is all Jesus in there. And he says these things. In John 15, I am the vine and you are, excuse me, I am the true vine and my father is the husbandman. Every branch in me that beareth not fruit, he takes away. And every branch that beareth fruit, he purges it that it may bring forth more fruit. Now you are clean through the word which I have spoken to you. There it is, okay? Abide in me and I in you as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself except it abides in the vine. No more can you except you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. He that abideth in me and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. For without me you can do nothing. We see the wonderful words of Jesus here. Also telling us how we have a desire for obedience and not a desire for sin, it comes by what John already writes about, walking in the light, being in the presence of God, being in the presence of his word. And we find that in Psalms 119.11, Old Testament. We find it here in John 15, abiding in me and my words abiding in you. And so that's the key. Many of us fall short in the completion of John 15 in those first five verses that I wrote. And what do I mean by that? Well, you and I may abide. We may abide in the word. We might take time quickly to read a few verses in the morning. That's abiding in the word. But the completion of that is Jesus also said... And the word abides in you. Which means that you and I are not only just reading the text and walking away, but that we are reading the text, trying to understand it by the work of the Holy Spirit who illuminates or lights the word of God to us so that we could also apply it to our life. Abiding in the word and the word abiding in us, that is the application and so, doing both of those things are critical to you and I doing as John's writing here. I desire that you sin not. And we can't do it on our own. We definitely can't do it on our own. Jesus says that, for without me you can do nothing. But we can't do it on our own. We have to be in the word daily. We have to be in the word daily. In Romans chapter 6, one of the texts I was referring to, who Paul wrote here in talking about that. And listen to what Paul writes in Romans chapter 6 and verse 1. After he's described all of these things in Romans chapter 5 and how Christ is our substitute there. Or he's talking about that by one man's sin into the world which is Adam, by Adam's sin, all men are sinners, but by one man's death on the cross, Christ dying on the cross can all be made alive. And that is, again, through 
the finished work of Jesus Christ. And so then Paul writes these words following the description of that. In verse 6, or verse 1 of Romans 6, What shall we then say? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? So shall we continue on sinning so we see God's grace even greater? God forbid, he says. How shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? So Paul challenging too, the same thing to what John is challenging. When you are born again, we shouldn't desire to sin. We shouldn't be living in sin. And then he goes on to describe in the remainder of the chapter, just quickly I'll read a few texts in verse 7. For he that is dead is freed from sin. Verse 18, being then made free from sin. I'm going to share that verse in a second. Verse 22, but now being made free from sin. So we see it a number of times, Paul writes. So Paul is describing not that we are free, that we're sinless, but that we are free from the power of sin. That we don't only choose sin. Before salvation, that's really all you can do. But at salvation and on, you don't have to give in to sin every single time because you have the Spirit working in your life. In Romans 14, Romans 6, 14, it says this, For sin shall not have dominion over you. You are not under the law, but under grace. And then he writes this, and I've shared it already. Being then made free from sin, what are we servants to? Righteousness. So you see a tremendous contrast to what Paul's writing here. As before salvation, we are servants to sin. And as he describes a lot of times through, through chapter 6, you are now, because you are born again, freed from sin. So what are we servant to? Servant of righteousness. So we see the tremendous contrast. I'm just give evidence in other passages of scripture to which John is trying to write here in chapter 2 of verse 1 that we sin not. Why don't we sin? Because we ought to be servants of righteousness, not of sin any longer. But we still do sin. And this is why John continues this verse. And if any man, that word if is really when. So when any man sinned, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. So even though John says, I desire you not to sin, don't sin. But then he says in the same sentence, but when you do sin, you have an advocate. So this is the tremendous hope that you and I have. The word advocate here means a defender. It means a comforter. It means one that comes alongside of. It means one to whom is, is as a defense lawyer. On earth, we have the Holy Spirit. We read about that in John 17. Jesus telling the disciples, I am going to leave, but I will send you another comforter. I will send you another advocate who will dwell with you. And so here on this earth, we have the Holy Spirit as our advocate. But in heaven, we have Jesus Christ, our advocate. As he says here, that advocate is with the Father. And who is that advocate? It is Jesus Christ. He is our defender. He is the one that pleads our case. He is our defense lawyer. So when you and I sin, we have Christ, the defense lawyer. But Jesus is also the lawyer on the other side. Because as we are in the light, what happens? It exposes our sin. So Jesus, both being the one who pleads our cause, but Jesus also, when we are in his presence, also exposes our sin. So when Jesus pleads before the Father, the judge in this case, Jesus being our advocate, Jesus exposes our sins, and the judge says, how do they plead? And Jesus says, they are guilty. And you and I say, we're guilty. 
Because when you come before a holy and righteous God, you will always be guilty. And so we're guilty. We can't plead non-guilty. Our sin is what it is. And so Jesus says, yes, they're guilty. But then he comes on this side as our defender, as our, uh, as our advocate. And he pleads our cause and he says, yes, they are guilty. And they deserve the fullest penalty, which is death. But, Father, you know that I have taken their place. That I have died for their sin. Not only is Jesus our advocate, but he is also the one to whom is our atonement, our atonement as well. So we see we are guilty. We do deserve death. But Jesus, as our advocate, steps to the bench, steps before the judge, the father, and says, they're guilty. Yes, they're guilty of everything. They deserve death. But I have paid the penalty. I took their place. I substituted for them. Justice has already been served at the cross. I died in their place. Now, Satan could easily step up and say, how many times is this going to happen? Every time that if I accuse them, you always step in with this. And you know how many times it's going to happen? Every time. He's not just your advocate on your worst sins, however you clarify that, but he's also your advocate on the ones that we do all the time. Speeding. Overeating. Lying. I love the verses in Hebrews because... It can shut the mouth of Satan very quickly, who we know the Bible calls him the accuser. See, in the Old Testament, this was the problem, and this is what Satan probably is arguing about. See, in the Old Testament, you had the high priest, and he would stand daily ministering and offering, offering oftentimes the same sacrifice, which can never take away sin. So in the Old Testament, the, the high priest would have to do it daily. You have to do it daily. And then, and then once a year, the Day of Atonement, you would have the sprinkling on the mercy seat there for the sin of all the people. But the verse doesn't end there, or that verse ends there, but the very next verse. This is how often Jesus advocates for you and I and what he had to do for it in verse 12. But this man, speaking of Jesus, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins for ever sat down on the right hand of God. So no longer is there this daily going to the temple, this daily sacrificing, but Christ has died once and for all, and because he's died once and for all, for all who believe, he forgives their sin forever. So he is the advocate forever. For every sin, not only the sins you've done up to today at 10 of 12, 7 of 12, <laughs> but even right after this, when you go in and fill yourself with more food than your body can handle, and whatever other things that we do the rest of this day that don't please God. And tomorrow, and next year, and 10 years, and 20 years, and 30 years, or 40 years, however long God tarries in your life, he is the advocate forever. What tremendous hope. I remember this lady years ago uh, had some issues going on in her life, and we took her daughter into our home for about a half a year or so, I think. I don't know how long it's been now. I remember going to visit with her mom and talking to her about Christ and sharing. And she said, Tim, I have no problem in Jesus forgiving my sins, but I have a hard time forgiving myself. 
she, she couldn't get over that. And I tried to explain to her that day, I, you know, I was trying to say, well, you only know the sins you've done up to this point. You don't even know what you're going to do the rest of your life. But if you're okay in believing that Christ died for you and that he forgives you, he not only forgives your sin up to this day, but he has already forgiven you for the days ahead and the years ahead of your life too. He's died for that. You can't get past what you've done up to this day. Christ, who knows all things, the Holy One, has already died on the cross for everything in your life and beyond. She still struggled with that. And I don't know how she even made out through that after that. We visited her a few more times. She ended up having to go into uh, prison for a little while. But I want you to look at your life today. You see your sin. And there's times I ran into people and said, you know, Tim, there's, there's no way God can forgive me for these things that I've done. And I want to say he He can. He does. He will. There's no sin that you may struggle with your whole life. You might have did something when you were 18 years old and you can't get it out of your mind. But if you generally bring that before your advocate, Jesus Christ, he'll forgive you. It might not take it out of your mind. That might be a thorn in your side for the rest of your life. But he forgives and I believe he forgets because he separates your sin as far as the east is from the west. In fact, we read verses where he says, I will remember your sin no more. The great advocate. And why is Jesus our advocate? Read the rest of the verse, verse 1. Jesus Christ, the righteous. The righteous. He is the righteous. He's the perfect. He's the pure. He's the holy. He's the one without sin. He is fully qualified to be yours and my advocate. Why? Because he's righteous without sin. Nobody else could take. Nobody else can stand in, in your place and nobody else can stand in my place. If somebody else stood in my place, they would still have to say, yeah, I'm just like them, a sinner. But I'm willing to take their place. That's nice and everything, but they're not qualified. Because Christ, or excuse me, the Father, God the Father demands perfection. He demands holiness. He demands righteousness of that which you and I cannot do apart from the finished work of Christ in our life. We can't do anything. So when we stand before the Father, he will see our sin if we are still dead in our sin. But if we have been born again, he no longer sees my righteousness, which is as filthy rags, but he sees the righteousness of Jesus Christ. Only Jesus alone is qualified to be the advocate. So we desire and strive not to sin, but we do ought to desire to follow after Christ. Let us not forget what Jesus did to be our advocate. We don't have time this morning, but I encourage you to reread Isaiah 53. We just got done studying uh, a series on, this, on the seven sayings of Jesus Christ on the cross. Reminder of that study. You can go back and watch it on Facebook. You can go watch it on YouTube if you hadn't grabbed those, that series there. But in Isaiah 53, let me just read. It's only four verses that I'm going to read. Just to remind us there, in beginning in verse 5, he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. And the chastisement of our peace was upon him. 
With his stripes we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord has laid on himself the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed. He was afflicted. Yet he did not even open his mouth. He was brought as a lamb to the slaughter. And as a sheep before his shears is dumb, so he opened not his mouth. He was taken from prison and judgment. And who shall declare his generation? For he was cut off out of the land of the living. And for the transgression of my people was he stricken. And he was made his grave with the wicked and with the rich in death. Because he had done no violence, neither was there any deceit in his mouth. Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He was put, he put him to grief when thou shalt make his soul an offering for sin. He shall see his seed, he shall prolong his days, and the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in the land. And on it goes through the remainder of the chapter. He is our righteousness. I, I love this verse. I share it often. 2 Corinthians 5.21 For he, Christ, hath made him to be sin for us who knew no sin. So Jesus was made sin for us who he did not know sin. He never sinned. For what reason? That we might be made the righteousness of God in him. This beautiful picture big word of imputation laying to one person's account something and laying to another person's account something else and this is what was laid our sin was laid to the account of Christ and what was laid to our account his righteousness so he added his righteousness We can't offer anything to God except for our sin. Then he's looking at verse 2. We'll come back to this next week or in two weeks, I should say, next week's Father's Day. Verse 2, really quick. We will revisit. And he is the propitiation for our sins. That word propitiation means he's a satisfaction for our sins. He's a satisfaction for our sins. Because he's our righteousness. Those two go together. He can't satisfy the Father without being righteous and holy before him. So he satisfied the wrath of the Father for our sins. And not only ours, but also the sins of the whole world. So Christ is a propitiation. He died. Here John saying not only for our sins those to whom believe in this moment, but for the sin of the whole world. Now, that does not mean that Jesus died for, uh, he doesn't forgive all sin in the world because you have to have, you have to be born again. You have to be born again by faith alone in Christ. We'll revisit that verse in two weeks. But I want to Show you one last verse. There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. You and I will sin. Should we sin as much as we did before we were saved? No, you shouldn't. There should be that metamorphosis that's happened because of Christ working in your life, the Holy Spirit indwelling your life. But the great thing is that when we do sin, we have an advocate. First John, who is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And today, my friends, you need to understand you have no forgiveness of sin without the shedding of the blood of Jesus Christ. I said it last week and I'll say it again this week. I can't forgive you. I can't do anything with your sin. If you offended me, then yes, I can can forgive you for offending me. Or if I offend you, hopefully you'll forgive me for offending you. So that's between person. But we also, when we sin before anybody, we're sinning before the holy righteous God. This is why David wrote in Psalm 51. Remember when David slept, slept with Bathsheba? So he, he had sinned, but he said, not, I'm not just sinning against me or against her. But look, my sin is before you. So David said, cleanse me. Cleanse me. 
So today, I ask of you today, have you sought for the cleansing of Jesus Christ? The washing of the word. And if you did, great. If you do, continue to great. But may you and I walk in the light as he is in the light too. There ought to be fellowship with God. Not just showing up on Sunday or not just asking confession of our sins just before we take communion. But it ought to be a daily thing. Not for salvation. Salvation's once done. You're born again only once. But sin happens every day. And forgiveness ought to follow with that too as well. Heavenly Father, I thank you for this time in the word here this morning. I pray that you would help us to know you more, Lord. May we be edified today, but may we be challenged, Lord. We know that John's writing to believers here, and John's making sure that believers know that they are believers and, and making sure that they compare themselves with one thing, the holy and righteous God. Lord, I pray today that you would help us to look at our own hearts and minds. May we be not only abiding in you, but may we also, having you abide in us, may we be attached to the vine. For we cannot produce any fruit if we're not attached to the vine, Lord. In fact, that continuation of John 15 tells us what you do with branches that are not attached. They are burned. No longer needed. So I pray today that you would work in each heart and mind. That you would help us, Lord, today if we have been born again by faith alone. That we would search our hearts and make sure that we are living in right ways as best we can. Though daily we fall into sin, God, help us to do our best to desire that no longer and to desire righteousness, to desire obedience, which cannot come apart from Christ working in our life, the Holy Spirit working in our life. I pray today that there may be one that does not know you as Lord and Savior. Lord, they, they know what you've done, but they haven't had faith in believing in what you've done on the cross and that they know you as the holy God and that they see their sin for what it is, separation from you. I pray today that each one in this room would testify to the truth of the word of God and the gospel and knowing that apart from you working in our life, we are dead in our sin and we have no hope. Help us to see your holiness, to see our sin, and be made reconciled to you today. I ask it all in the precious name of Jesus. Amen. Would you please stand as we sing just the first verse of I Surrender All, hymn 596. Father, give us a good day. Lord, bless the time and the fellowship that we're going to have over lunch and give us a good time there. Help us to leave here, Lord, serving you, desiring to live for you. And on the moments that we don't, help us to seek your forgiveness. I pray it all in the precious name of Jesus. Amen. You can go back there. You can go to the bathroom, do what you got to do. And then once everybody's in there, we'll pray for the food and then you'll eat. Okay.